A very warm welcome to our webinar. Uh, the title is Mycotoxin Risks in the Food and Feed Supply Chain. <clears throat> what I'm going to do, <clears throat> I'm just going to wait for about one more minute just to allow people to join. And, and then I will continue to uh, give a little bit of background information to what it is we're hoping to achieve today, just in terms of, of the information that you're going to receive but also, very importantly, the information that you are going to supply to us, the, uh, the panel as well. So we'll start very, very soon. Okay, I'm going to start in about 30 seconds because we do have one hour. Well, I think this one hour is going to pass really, really very, very quickly because we, we do have a lot of information that we want to share with you. But also, we want to get the, the feedback um, information that you're going to be asked in terms of some polls. But also, really importantly, think about the questions that are coming to your mind as we go through all of this different information. And then please, by all means, put them into the Q&A uh, uh, box, which is at the bottom of your screen. I'll do introductions to our, to our panel members in a moment, but I think first of all, <clears throat> what I would like to do, just to set the scene a little bit about mycotoxins. Now, clearly the fact that you have decided to join our webinar today means that mycotoxins is, is a subject that you have an interest in. But I wonder, and you now realize that the most recent data, and, and I was part of the group that, that put this together, now established that depending on which crop it is, somewhere between 60 and 80% of all crops now contain mycotoxins. So basically think about virtually every material that you have to deal with, which is plant-based, <clears throat> is, is a problem for you in terms of mycotoxins. And it's not just about food safety risks. We're going to talk about some of the risks and that, that are coming up, but also it can have a massive financial impact on your business. It can have a massive in terms of negative performance on both the welfare and the performance of, of livestock. We're getting more and more information and worrying information about actually the environmental impact and the carbon footprint associated with mycotoxins. And also, we, we now are very, very concerned about food waste and reducing food waste, but actually mycotoxins is one of the really big contributors in the world to mycotoxins or, or to food waste. And so lots and lots of things that we want to look at. So really, our, our focus for today at the webinar, be it morning, evening or afternoon for you, is thinking about new ways of moving from being reactive to a particular problem, the mycotoxin problem, to being proactive. And that is really a very big challenge. So we're going to talk about the, the, the risks in, in, in terms of, of what mycotoxins bring to you and how forecasting can actually bring those risks to your desktop really very quickly and in a very accurate way, and then allows you to think about how you can deal with it. So that's what our panel is going to discuss and debate today. So mitigation of mycotoxins. I mean, there, there are lots and lots of different ways that businesses try to deal with it at the moment. And generally we divide it into pre-harvest into post-harvest. <clears throat> Some of it is around getting good sampling, good analytical methods, the application of good agricultural practice. And also there, there are really issues that, that are coming to the fore, not even about regu regulatory frameworks, but about rapidly changing regulatory frameworks, which actually is an additional risk that we all have to think about. So there are different ways that you can think about detoxifying mycotoxins, but really what we want to think about is this predictive analytic side of things. How can you predict what mycotoxins may or not be in the particular crops that you're working with? So now is the time to introduce our panel. Uh, I'll, I'll start off with myself because I've been talking a little bit so far. My name is Chris Elliott. I'm Professor of Food Safety at Queen's University Belfast and Professor of Food Security at Tamazat University in Thailand. And one of our big projects is mycotoxins, particularly associated with livestock. And I'm really delighted to be, to be joined with, with some really 
industry experts. I'm, I'm the academic who just sits and writes things. These are the experts who actually do things and have to deal with lots of problems. So the first is Maria uh, Velascariu, who is the ex-corporate R&D and VP and Chief Scientific Officer from Mars. And uh, we're also joined by Joe Tierney, who's Regulator and Food Safety Department Lead at Terlan, uh, Terlan previously known as Glambia. And our fourth and, and, and final panel member is Gianna Stoikitis, who is Chief Technology Officer and Partner of Agrono, who is hosting our webinar today. So many thanks for Agrono for bringing all of this together. So I think now it's my job to stop talking and start listening because I'm going to pass you over to Giannis now. Thank you so much, Chris, and uh, thank you for this very interesting intro. I'm very happy to be in this uh, webinar, in a webinar that deals with a very specific risk, and I'm looking forward to getting uh, your feedback about the, the risk of mycotoxins in the supply chain, in the global, but also in the specific supply chains that you are responsible for. Uh, so I would like also uh, Maria and Joe to make a short statement, and then I will uh, I will move uh, with a short intro about the work that we are doing. So, Maria. Thank you, Yanis. It's great to be here today. This is such an important topic that touches on every single ingredient, pretty much uh, plant ingredient and food that we consume, as well as feed. We must remember it is uh, feeding people and feeding animals. So it's really important to use the uh, uh, emerging and fast growing AI tools to do a better job with predicting, prescribing solutions and mitigating aquatoxin issues, uh, mycotoxin and aquatoxin, which is one of the most uh, it is it's very common in food to be able to predict them. Thank you for uh, the invitation. And uh, hello all, and uh, thank you also for, for the, the invite. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, certainly from an industry perspective, it's very encouraging this uh, dual work between academia and obviously Professor Elliot and uh, and the team here at Agrino, just to look at predictive modeling related to mycotoxins. And I'd echo what Maria said. There's a lot of, there's huge benefits from an industry perspective around predicting uh, before uh, we receive grain for, for processing. So again, looking at the, the metadata and the predictive model uh, and in, in more detail and, and seeing how we can use that in our risk profiling. So um, I'm very encouraged by it all and uh, happy to be involved in this discussion. Thank you so much. So before uh, going to, the, to a short intro about the work that we are doing, uh, uh, we have a, a very short poll about which is your uh, how you rank uh, mycotoxins risk in your supply chain compared to other risks that that you have. So if you if you want to give us a short answer to that, So thank you so much for that. It seems that half of the participants that we have today uh, with us, and thank you very much for joining this webinar, uh, uh, are ranking mycotoxins risk as, the, uh, as a high risk compared to other risks. So this is very important. Uh, and uh, medium and low are equally uh, split it uh, to almost to 25%. Eh? So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I will make a very short, uh, I'm sharing the results, uh, I will make a very short intro about the work that we are doing in, uh, on building tailored AI models for specific supply chains. Uh, so, first of all, Agrono, we are the data and analytics company that uses AI to predict food safety risks. Uh, our promise is that we deliver to the companies that we are working with uh, reliable risk forecasting for critical raw materials and ingredients by thoroughly tested and highly accurate AI models. 
we are measuring, we are continuously measuring our promise uh, by uh, using accuracy metrics like the accuracy, the, the percentage of the uh, accuracy of each deployed model. Uh, and uh, also we use uh, application oriented uh, uh, metrics like uh, the percentage of the recalls that have been early highlighted as an emerging risk using our models. Uh, so th in this way, we are trying to, to measure continuously the promise that we are uh, uh, delivering and uh, uh, the services that we are, the AI services that we are delivering uh, to the companies. The main concern that we hear in the food industry, uh, every time that we are uh, talking to experts like uh, you, uh, is uh, if we can really predict important risks in the supply chain using AI models. And today, uh, we will try to answer this question for the case of mycotoxins, but uh, we are we are already applying and trying and uh, deploying AI models uh, from uh, 2021 uh, that are trying to forecast the risk trends for several ingredients, raw materials, uh, and the models, and we are providing these models through uh, dashboards uh, in our uh, Fudakai risk intelligence platform. The way, the, the approach that we are following to build uh, the AI models is that we start by creating, by identifying which are the very important factors that we need to use in uh, our models. And we are creating the tailor-made data sets for uh, these models and specifically for each ingredient for each region. And then based on the, the, the business question that we, are, we need to answer, we select the appropriate uh, machine learning approach. Uh, if we have to do, if we need to uh, predict, uh, to classify something, then a classification method is a good uh, a good option. If we need to forecast the risk level, for instance, then a time series forecasting method could be uh, a good option. So we select very carefully which approach we will follow. And after selecting the right approach, we are uh, training and testing the prediction model. Uh, and we are trying to uh, refine the parameters of each model to achieve the best performing, the best performance in terms of accuracy, but also in terms of uh, uh, other criteria that has to do with uh, the application of the specific model. So this is the way uh, that uh, we are developing such models. But uh, I will now hand over back to Chris because I would like very much to hear from the experts which are the key questions in the industry that we need to answer uh, regarding the mycotoxins risks. Yeah, many, many thanks for that, Janice. And, and this is the time to start to think about key questions that you would like to ask. And what we have done is we really start to think about what we think the key questions are. And for our pa panel members, Maria and Joe, we, they had some time to think about this, reflect upon this, uh, and then feedback some of their, their, their thoughts. So maybe, Maria, we'll, we'll start with you just in terms of using AI to build stronger testing and de-risking strategies. What do you think are the most important points that you would like to make? Thank you, Chris. Ultimately, this is about our ability to make accurate forecasts for the levels of mycotoxins and the types of mycotoxins for specific ingredients, food and feed that we are sourcing in certain regions and we consume in same regions or other regions, because here we're talking about the global trade. So here are some important considerations in my mind. And the first one is, uh, do the companies today put the appropriate efforts to develop uh, not just um, any, uh, any, any, any predictive model for mycotoxin, but actually sophisticated models, because we're talking here about a very big, uh, widely spread phenomenon. The second question is, which factor should we take into account? And this is a very complex issue. So we should consider uh, a multitude of uh, factors like climate and weather, 
like cropping systems, seeds, agricultural practices, uh, pesticides, the use of insecticides, the use of water, and so forth. Also a number of geopolitical factors for a uh, global trade and um, actually very complex um, supply chains. And as Professor Elliot said earlier on, the, um, the, the changing, the ever-changing regulatory environment, because uh, mycotoxins are not regulated in all countries and they're not regulated in the same way. Of course, important, it's important to consider the testing and surveillance programs that exist uh, within companies, but also at uh, industry level. And how you bring this all together, it's fundamental to our ability to test and survey um, effectively is our lab testing capabilities and how we set up a risk-based laboratory testing uh, approach and with the associated programs. And the last but not least is how are we going to use these AI models within organizations and across industry to optimize the outcomes for the investment? And how are we going to have the best return on the budgetary investment? And this is people and money so that we have the ability to forecast and then we have the ability to put in place prevention and mitigation measures. Maria, many thanks for that. I think what you did was you captured a lot of the big issues very, very well, but also the fact that what companies need are information about very specific risks as well. So thank you for that. Joe, we'll, we'll pass over to you now with, with your chance to kind of reflect on those questions that we posed to you earlier. Yes. So I suppose un undoubtedly from a, a mycotoxin risk perspective, Per perspective, any type of prediction that is, again, robust and accurate in its construction is very welcome. So I suppose one of the items around the how do we use the data and AI to inform processors in advance of, of risk of mycotoxin, you could argue that a, a red, amber, green or a simple RAG status of the, the mycotoxins for the export markets is, is key. And I see that's being part of the, the uh, offering there or the in development. So I think that's certainly to be encouraged. I know, and again, uh, I suppose I've listened to a few of your talks previously, uh, Chris, but the, the, the metadata supporting conditions around how mycotoxins form, either pre-harvest, post-harvest, all of that is uh, significant. And obviously understanding the metadata going into the model to make sure that it's robust and, and delivers us some early warning, I think is, 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 is point number one. Um, Point number two is, I suppose, the proposed sampling. And again, I know this has been flagged several times, but just the standardization of how you take a sample and ensuring the, again, the robustness of that program such that it's repeatable. And uh, I suppose all results, regardless of where they're coming from, can uh, there's visibility around it and it can be relied upon. Um, I think Maria touched on this around the testing side. Certainly the standardization of the analytical method, uh, alternatives, it could be a lateral flow or rapid method of some sort or whatever it might be to measure the target mycotoxin of interest and obviously keeping an eye also on the maximum residue levels as they are being uh, issued uh, and again compound feed is an example in process regulatory limits around it uh, and again always there's the aflatoxin in one let's say for milk as an example or other uh, mycotoxins, the dioxin of Alnor, uh, NOL as an example, again, all of these will have uh, proposed MRLs that we need to be aware of. And obviously the analytical method should match at least what's expected from a maximum residue uh, limits perspective. And then obviously emerging mycotoxins, uh, I think uh, keeping up to date with the science and obviously linking in with academia on the same, uh, and obviously being part of the industry groups uh, to understand what's new and, and its impact on, on both the food and animal feed side of it. And then the last number four, which is learnings from the previous mycotoxin risk prediction models. And I know there was a few that we discussed recently around previous work and literature published and maybe some learnings around it. So again, staying close to industry, uh, maybe opportunity to share knowledge, maybe even results uh, and looking external and, and combining and pooling results and data and looking carefully at the metadata used to construct the predictive model. So they're the, the items, I suppose, of interest for, from our end. I mean, that that is really great. And that, that's such a wonderful build on the information that, that Maria gave us. And, you know, again, often I say, you know, because you, you talked about metadata and I say good data in means really good data out. 
and bad data in means rubbish data out. And I think this is one of the things that Janice is going to talk about just in terms of how data is handled. And I think the example that you gave, Joe, just about we are really in the eye of the storm about changing regulations and compound feed. That's where, you know, I think so many companies need help and support. So Janice, over to you to, to describe us to us, you know, how does this all work? Thank you so much. And thank you, Joe and Maria, for sharing this very uh, interesting and very important points. Uh, and especially the questions that is very, uh, very important to answer uh, when you are in the industry. So uh, I will, my presentation will have two parts. In the first part, I will focus more on the design principles that we need to follow when uh, we are trying to develop uh, an AI model that will uh, be applied in the practice. Uh, and I will comment and uh, provide some information about many of the things that uh, Maria and Joe touched. And the second part of the presentation, I will uh, show you how uh, such a dashboard can look like, which uh, are the operations that uh, it can provide. Uh, and uh, yeah, in the uh, Q&A, but also after this uh, webinar, uh, we would be we would love to to get some feedback about that. Uh, so, listening to to the questions, but also, uh, I I try to bring in my mind what we hear in the industry about the business problem, uh, and the business problem that we hear has to do with the investment, with the large investment that the companies. Uh, are making every year uh, for testing uh, for mycotoxins uh, and how difficult is the choice between the frequency uh, and the cost uh, and uh, we hear them uh, we hear the experts saying that uh, uh, they wish uh, that uh, they had a software system that could combine and analyze all the different data that uh, we are discussing here today that exist out there, but also inside the companies to help them to predict and prevent food safety incidents that have to do with mycotoxins before actually they happen. And the specific critical business decision that we would like to, to help to support is how to set up the optimal monitoring program for mycotoxin, for the specific mycotoxins, that will be risk-based and will focus on uh, the high-risk uh, batches that I'm getting in my supply chain. So starting uh, with this, having in mind this problem and this uh, decision that we would like to support, I will share some thoughts first about the uh, design principles that we we need to follow if we want to uh, to build to deploy an AI model that will have a, a practical value, uh, and then I will show you uh, how this model and how the dashboard powered by such model can look like. So I would like to answer with this slide. I would like to answer to the very important question uh, that uh, Joe made about the previous works and the previous studies and the, the, the work that have been done in predicting mycotoxins so far. Uh, and it's, it is true that during the last 20 years, we have several uh, very important results uh, reported in the uh, literature uh, about predicting uh, specific mycotoxin risks. Uh, the types of the models uh, that uh, uh, have been developed are mainly four. Uh, the mechanistic, the empirical, the hybrid, and the machine learning. Uh, here, I would like mostly to, to emphasize three things. The first thing is that uh, these models are highly sophisticated, and uh, they all the models seem to have a, a good performance uh, according to the reported uh, accuracy. Uh, and they are uh, touching and they are ap applied in a very specific supply chains for a very specific region. So the, the very good news is that we have already uh, different types of uh, models that has been, 
have been successfully applied uh, in real uh, world problems. Uh, to that, I would like to add that during the last years, we have also machine learning models. Uh, either using uh, a simple logistic regression approach or Bayesian networks or even deep learning models. So uh, they, they are constantly new methods that uh, are used uh, in order to build a predictive model for mycotoxins. The second thing that I would like to highlight from the study of the uh, literature is that the reported accuracy is, is good. It's, it seems that the, the, these models are working well under specific uh, conditions eh? and with specific uh, limitations, but uh, they are working well. And the third thing that I would like to, to highlight uh, from the literature is that, of course, it is, as it always happen, uh, happens, uh, there are limitations. Uh, I would say that the, the limitations are, uh, we have two types of limitations. The one type of limitation is that many of these types of models uh, require substantial amount of uh, input data, specific data, data that are, uh, uh, that provide information about uh, the local uh, conditions uh, that uh, a crop was uh, uh, produced. Uh, so this is this is something uh, very important to keep in mind that without substantial amount of data, these kind of models cannot perform very well. The second uh, thing, the second important uh, limitation, is that even in the case of models that can uh, be built, uh, e even if we have data gaps, like the case of Bayesian network models, uh, the update of such models. Uh, can uh, be challenging okay? and can be time consuming. And uh, one comment about the limitation of the deep learning models, which can be uh, can model complex patterns and they are, they are very promising, is that again, it's very important to have large amount of homogeneous data and computational resources in order to be, to build a successful model. So let's keep in mind these three, three, three things as highlights from the industry, from the literature, sorry. The second very important thing, the second very important principle, and Maria mentioned that, is that uh, it's, it's very important to take into account the risk drivers that may increase the likelihood, the likelihood of mycotoxins in food and feed uh, crops when we design uh, such a model. Uh, and uh, you already mentioned several factors, uh, so I will not repeat them. Uh, weather and climate change seems to be uh, one of the top uh, drivers, uh, but there are also other, other uh, factors that may increase the risk of mycotoxins in our supply chain. And the way that we can identify these uh, risk factors is either using the literature or uh, end not, not either, using both the literature uh, from all the studies that uh, there are out there for predicting myto mycotoxins, but also very important is to consult also the, uh, the experts and to hear from their experience, uh, to trust their expertise on which are the risk factors that we need to take into account. What is important to keep in mind when we are talking about the risk drivers and these factors here is that behind each factor in order to integrate this factor in our model we need to have data so again the data uh, the importance of having homogeneous data uh, that can help us to build such models at a large scale is is very critical the other uh, principle, uh, and uh, this is something that is uh, well known in, uh, in the world uh, of uh, AI, is that uh, it's important to compare different uh, machine learning and deep learning methods and to select and to choose the best performing one, uh, the one that fits better to the specific pro uh, problem. I, I mentioned this already. So if we want to keep one thing here is that 
we should not go straight direct and directly select one method because we feel uh, or we we think that it will perform well we need we need to compare different methods and choose the best performing ones how to choose the best performing ones is uh, can be answered through validation so another principle a very important principle is uh, how is that we need to validate and we need to select a very good validation framework and the validation framework can be based on accuracy criteria, accuracy-based criteria, uh, but it's also very important to use non-accuracy-based criteria, like for instance, in the case of uh, if we want to uh, optimize the monitoring program, uh, it's important to use a criteria like the associated costs of uh, monitoring. So we can use also this criteria to identify which is the uh, machine learning method or deep learning method that performs better uh, than the other uh, methods uh, that uh, we can use for this specific problem. So validation, uh, it's very important to keep in mind that validation, we, we should use accuracy-based metrics, but it's also important if we want to have a practical application of the AI model to use also a non-accuracy criteria. And here I give the example of uh, associated costs. So let's see, using these principles, how uh, a dashboard, uh, an, an AI dashboard that can be used to set up a risk-based monitoring approach can look like. So first of all, uh, I hear also in, uh, in the things that uh, it's, it's important to consider uh, when we are developing such model is that they should be user friendly. Eh? They should uh, provide, allow some interactivity. So uh, we, the goal here is to provide an interactive dashboard, allowing us to select specific mycotoxins, as uh, Maria mentioned. It's very important to, to select aflatoxin, ochratoxin, different types of aflatoxin, or even emerging uh, mycotoxins. Uh, and also to select the specific food or feed for which ingredient for which uh, I would like to, to have the, uh, the risk prediction. The model is able using also the regional information, uh, the geographical information, uh, is able to highlight the most risk re risky regions. And by selecting a region, for instance, United States, India, China, or Ukraine, we can go and see uh, specifically for this region, which is the level of the risk. When it comes to the data, a, a very a first thing that we can do, a first, a fir, uh, the first thing that uh, we can use in terms of data are the large data sets that we have from the testing, from the monitoring programs. And there are several uh, variables that uh, with a high value there, uh, like the country of analysis, the country of origin, the sample ID, the ingredient, uh, the data of data of analysis, the specific mycotoxin, but also the analytical result. So uh, it's important, and uh, we can use this kind of data to allow us to predict uh, if we will have a non-compliant uh, sample or subsequently batch. So what such an AI model could predict? Eh? The AI model in this case, if we use, for instance, the monitoring uh, results, could predict uh, the number of the batches that are non-compliant and should be analyzed. Uh, and these are the true positives and the false positives. Uh, and those that should not be analyzed, which are the true negatives and false negatives. And this can give us a very good uh, idea about the probability of having a non-compliant batch, for instance, for uh, maize, for having a, a non-compliant non -compliant batch for aflatoxin in maize from uh, Brazil. So we can have already the risk level and the probability of having uh, an uh, increased risk of mycotoxins, of aflatoxin in, in the batches. As I mentioned, it's also very important to transform uh, this, the prediction results 
to something that is practical and very useful uh, for the companies. And so here is the cost of monitoring program. And there is a recent uh, work by Wong et al. Uh, that uh, uh, proposed uh, a very interesting way of transforming the prediction results uh, to the cost of the monitoring program, to the anticipated cost of the monitoring program by using uh, the follow-up actions that we want to apply in each case. So this is this is something that we can use uh, in order to deliver through the dashboard uh, the uh, estimation of the cost for the program, for the monitoring program. And this can be done based on the predicted results. So for instance, we are showing here that the, for the uh, true positive, it's important to do the, uh, the follow-up actions is of course sampling and analysis uh, and maybe storage. So these are the cost components also that uh, we can use to estimate which will be the cost uh, for sampling analysis and storage uh, for the one batch that uh, it seems that will be non-compliant based on the predicted results. And this kind of uh, results can help us to, to see also the return of investment, to see how good is the optimization. So uh, how, how, uh, how, how much better and which is the cost of the uh, risk-based program compared to the current monitoring program that we have. One last thing about the practical application of the model is that the, as uh, already John mentioned, it's very important to provide an answer to the question, which is the sampling and analysis approach that I should follow. And of course, there are uh, best practices for that uh, from in regulation. Uh, companies are following their own private uh, system for monitoring uh, mycotoxins. Uh, we know that increasing the number of samples or uh, collecting samples at multiple steps or uh, at multiple control points can decrease the probability to accept a contaminated batch. So uh, taking into account all these measures, we can build a very good sampling and uh, analysis strategy. Uh, we can use also, this is an optimization problem there, how much we can test in order, uh, which is the approach that we should follow in order to make sure that we will uh, make the risk of mycotoxins minimum. So an optimization model, again, can be used here to define the sampling and analysis strategy at the different uh, stages of the supply uh, chain. And last, last but very important thing, and this is a good practice that we are following in all our uh, AI dashboards, is uh, uh, the transparency and the explainability on how this model works, which are the data that has been uh, used for building the model, uh, which are the uh, economical model that was used to estimate the cost, uh, which are the most important insights that we see. So I will finish my uh, presentation uh, by saying that uh, uh, using adjusting the monitoring program and making it uh, a risk based from being reactive to proactive. But of course, there are also other uh, preventive measures that can be activated, uh, like uh, proactively adjust the supplier practices, uh, like to adjust your uh, audit plan, and uh, maybe in some cases also change suppliers for some period. So thank you, thank you very much for your attention. I would be very happy to answer questions that we I see that we already have in the Q and A, but also I would like to uh, to hear the reflection uh, from our experts, from our panelists here. Before uh, doing that, uh, we can we would really appreciate to get your answers about uh, which are the food and fit categories that is important for you to have such a risk-based monitoring approach. So I will give a minute for that. And then, uh, Chris, I will hand over back to you so we can continue the discussion and to hear the reflection 
from our experts. So thank you very much, Janice. We'll give we'll give everybody some time to uh, cast their vote. <clears throat> and uh, as always, when I hear you speak, I learn a bit more, but also more questions come into my mind as well. <clears throat> but there, there is already a lot of questions coming into the Q&A box. So please uh, add some more questions. I think there are some really superb questions there that I'm gonna pose particularly to Janice a, a little bit later on. So I'm, I'll maybe just head back just to see uh, how is the voting going on and have we have we found what the, the most important categories are, Janice? Yes, so I will close now the poll. I think that, and I will share also the results with all. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, cereals and nuts and seeds are the, uh, the ones that... Uh, it's very important to have such risk-based monitoring approach, of course, based on the on the answers of the participants. And thank you so much uh, for that. But also other categories like uh, animal feed, like herbs and spices, and fruits and vegetables are uh, very critical in terms of categories. So thank you so much. And uh, I would love to hear the reflection and then to, to answer some questions from the audience, if possible, all, of course. That's great, Janice, thanks. And I think that poll is really good because I think it, it really accurately reflects a lot of the information we see, let's say, in RASIF notifications that it's spread across many, many different categories, but cereals and, and nuts and, 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 and seeds are really, really important. So I think we, we, we can now move on to reflections in terms of, of our panel. And uh, really, again, we have had some time to, to listen to your presentation, to think about the presentation. And again, Maria, we go back to you just in terms of, I guess, the three key questions that we pose to you is, do you agree about what do you think is currently missing and what value do you see in this AI approach for industry? Thank you, Chris. And and Yanis, thank you for a very thorough um, presentation and helping us understand what this AI-based approach would look like and how we would come together. Um, artificial intelligence would really enable mycotoxin prediction to be leapfrog, to go to the next level. And this is about everything and anything pertaining to uh, this issue as a whole system. So the type, the, of, of, of mycotoxin, the crop type, where they grow, where the food is consumed, whether it is direct application of the crop or indirect um, into the food, um, consumption patterns, trade patterns, and equally importantly for the companies investing and actually for national labs uh, and acad academia investing in this kind of research is how do we maximize the outcome for the resources invested? How do we get the best possible information? How, how can we create um, the best possible predictive models, which will then lead us to early action and effective action to mitigate aflatoxins? Equally, for those who do not have unlimited budgets, they, you know, they, they, the question is, this is the budget I've got. What can I possibly do for the problem at hand? This is very important, particularly for small and medium-sized enterprises. What is missing? Some of the things that are missing today, I don't think they will be missing in the future because technology and AI and um, digital uh, and technological infrastructures are really growing very fast in the industry these days. But I do think that it is important to have universally reliable and accurate sampling. Samples have to be representative and the analytical protocols have to be accurate and precise. And you know, what we're talking about here is we're talking about heterogeneous systems like grains and nuts and fruits. You know, they are not homogeneous in nature. When we homogenize everything, it's much easier than you know, at the level of the crop. Also, as we get more and more data and we produce multiple iterations, the models will become better. I would like to see more incorporation additional to sample uh, analytics. I would like to see the incorporation of other data sources like for instance, um, um, the internet of things, traceability data, meteorological data, and so forth. But this will come also with the sophistication and the confidence that we will uh, build in these models. 
the last thing is a repetition of what we said earlier on. We are dealing today with a patchwork of risk tolerances as well as regulatory limits. So this, if we had more consistency and more convergence, I think it would be easier. It would help with the, the prediction and now uh, um, both of the uh, ability of the model, but also I think analyzing the, 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 the cost, what it would take to build a model. Uh, I definitely there is a huge amount of value, the ability to predict um, and have better foresight and insights, extremely important as early in the supply chain as possible. When we address, the, when we identify and address the problem earlier on, we're having multiple benefits, including less environmental impact because we're not shipping the grains, we're not shipping the product. I think it is very important to uphold quality standards and compliance to the regulations and actually the promise of brands to consumers and, and customers. And I think strategically at an industry level, there are so many benefits. The ability to anticipate and address emerging path patterns is very important because then you can have the right coalitions between the private enterprise and the public sector and academia to actually address issues pertaining to the people, the planet, but also the economies involved here, particularly when it comes to trade and very valuable income for people who grow the crops and particularly people growing them in, 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 in developing countries and, and, and areas where climate is really a big threat right now. So Maria, Maria thank, thank you. you very much. I have to quickly go on to uh, Joe now and also give you some thought, time to uh, reflect on what we've heard, Joe. Great. Th thank you, Chris. Look, similar to, to what Maria had said, there's probably a lot of synergies between the response here, but I think certainly uh, we, we'd, we'd, we'd all agree from an industry perspective, a robust predictive model to to uh, to look for the um, the risk factors and, and to predict uh, future issues around mycotoxins is definitely needed. Collaboration between the regions and obviously the finer details around how you collect that data, the validation of the system. And I see some of the questions questions touch on this as well and I want to leave time for those but it, it, I think the robustness of how we collect it in a, in a standard way how we sample in a standard way how we get better engagement globally really uh, and that it's a globally sourced material and obviously the prevailing conditions where you source it from have impact and obviously how we collect it in what format in a standard way to inform on the risk profile that we can rely upon as a, as a robust measure of, of risk from mycotoxins. Um, I suppose what's missing maybe the approach in the AI system validation and, and I kind of was touched upon but I think obviously the uh, one of my colleagues on the on the line here as well from the data analytics side of it uh, you know that it's just to review that in detail uh, we all are familiar with analytical methodology validation ISO standard uh, validation of the same it's just to again in AI speak uh, and I and I agree with Maria the more data we have the more robust and reliable the data will be in the prediction so again it's just to look into that in a bit more detail and the value that I see for the industry is the pre-warning that it will bring. It's a game changer really in relation to how we manage the business. Uh, and obviously, rather than relying on, on testing and uh, you know information from in-market, of course, that will continue as, as normal to maintain food and feed safety. But this will be the next level of, of prediction that again can be a true uh, global model on uh, mycotoxin risk. So I'd encourage that for sure. Joe, many thanks. That, that's a really good good summary. And I'm going to be really quick just in terms of my reflections, because I think, you know, Maria, Joe and I agree that there's there's lots of positives. I think also we're, we're agreeing that we, we need to see more evidence about, about case studies, really, that those predictive analytics have these desired consequences. And then in terms of the value for industry, I think, Janice, the data that you showed is you can make a real business case out of this based on, on financial returns for, for investment in, in, in new technologies. So I think I think there's lots of things that, that we can we, we can uh, as a group reflect on. But I, I am really much more interested now, not on my reflections, but on, on the, the audience actually. So maybe uh, if we, we can think about uh, getting ready to take some some questions and and um, <clears throat> I think there, there are really good questions here, and I'm going to start off with, and, and, and I'm sorry, Janice, you're going to be in the firing line here. The questions are coming your way, and they're really good questions. And in terms of the, the source of the data and the models to feed the AI risk prediction, you know, 
In terms of the data that you get, how robust can you say the different data sources are from academia, from industry, from NGOs? Have you any way that you can uh, uh, moderate the data that goes into the models? Yeah, the, the only way uh, currently, this is this is a very good point, and, and, and I fully agree, uh, Chris, that uh, does not make sense for us to make the reflection. Uh, that's why I'm going directly to the questions from audience. Uh, so this is a very good point. There are, uh, we are applying two ways of uh, moderating, of uh, ensuring the quality of the data. Uh, first of all, I want to, to, to answer on that, that we need to have a review. So we cannot tr trust the data that are uh, publicly available. Not that they are not good data, they are good data, but there are many uh, problems with uh, the uh, different formats used with missing values in some cases. So we need to moderate them. Uh, we are applying two ways. The first way is uh, machine algorithms that are checking which are the gaps of the data, if there are any missing values, if there are any non-consistent values, or if there are any values that are not uh, according to data standards. Uh, one example of data standard is, for instance, uh, the CAS uh, classification for uh, hazards uh, or the FoodEx uh, classification for food products. And the other uh, thing that we are doing is that after this uh, machine uh, curation and machine uh, quality check, we have also experts on our side that are checking if there are any issues and that they are validating the quality of the data. Uh, and uh, in my, according to my experience, this happens not only for the public data sources, but the even data that we have uh, in, in, inside the organizations, uh, we still have the issue of uh, harmonizing all the data, of having data gaps. So the same methods needs to be applied there as well. Thanks, Janice. I'm going to go on to because often people used to think that it was 25% of all crops were contaminated with mycotoxins. And I said, no, it's more like 60 or 80%. And Joe, the reason we've moved from 25% to 60 to 80% is about two things. It's about better sampling, better testing, but also the really big factor is change in our climate. So obviously, how can you really start to think about incorporating climate into your models? Because climate is a big thing and, and you know, it, it can have massive effects in, in, in very small isolated uh, regions. So how do you start to think about building that in to really build the robustness of the models? Yeah, so adding, starting only from one a very critical parameter, like for instance, the, all the monitoring results that we have globally is, is a good start. But of course, the models needs to include also other uh, factors. Uh, and uh, adding a parameter on uh, for the local weather is something that uh, is very important to, to do so. Uh, and uh, there are methods, machine learning methods, uh, that allows that, and we can add this uh, parameter. Uh, but also combining uh, more traditional models like the uh, empirical one, uh, the empirical ones, uh, uh, or the mechanistics, uh, is another way of integrating more information about the cropping system, about the soil type, uh, uh, so about the, uh, the harvesting conditions. Uh, and this can be so we can have a hybrid approach that is not a hybrid approach in terms of uh, mechanistic, uh, using mechanistic and empirical models, but in terms of combining the, uh, the first predictive models with machine learning uh, approaches uh, in order to add and to uh, take into account also other factors like the weather, the climate change, the geopolitical situation, um, and many more. Uh, there, are, there are many factors that we can we can add. Thank you. 
I'd like to follow up on something particularly I think Joe mentioned, and that was around validation. And, you know, I think we're, we're all, I hope, pretty comfortable about validation of analytical tests in terms of how you determine their sensitivity, their accuracy and so forth. <clears throat> but here we're actually talking about a very different type of, of validation, Janice, because you said is you train your model and then you validate your model. <clears throat> but it, to my mind, you also have to test that model to make sure that your 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 validation has actually worked as well. And again, this is a is is back to the robustness. Does that that does that training and validation does that mean that that percentage reliability accuracy that you talked about is, is true, or is it just a, a kind of a mathematical um, 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 hypothetical number that you're coming up with? This is very important. What we are describing in terms of validation, and uh, also Maria and so uh, mentioned that, is that uh, having only the mathematical validation, so using the accuracy metrics uh, and uh, taking uh, advantage of the of of the knowledge that we have of what happened in the past, and comparing the, what the model could predict with what actually happened. Uh, mathematically will give us uh, the result of the accuracy. Yeah? But uh, this is this is the one thing. Uh, and we can do this uh, in an exhaustive way. So we can see different periods for different cases and we can see mathematically how good these models uh, are and uh, which is the performance of the models. Uh, but it's also important uh, to validate the models for the specific application that we want to have. So even if we have a very accurate, mathematically, if we have an accurate model uh, that does not perform very well when we, we want to have cost efficiency, it does not make sense to select this, uh, uh, this model. So uh, there is a trade-off there of selecting the models that can perform well from a mathematical point of view, using only the accuracy-oriented criteria, but uh, also to consider the non-accuracy uh, criteria. Like in this case, the associated cost of the monitoring program and how much we can make it more efficient or fit it to the specific budget that a company has to make it very efficient for this amount of uh, budget, for this budget is very important. But it's, it's a, a very... It's a very critical uh, step eh, in developing the models. I fully agree with your point. Thank you. And I mean, I, I first of all, I want to thank everybody for all of the questions that came in. And there's many, many more questions that we don't have time to answer. And hopefully, I mean, I'll, I'll discuss with Janice. We'll maybe try to get you some answers coming back uh, after the webinar, because I think the questions are absolutely fantastic. And also, I think, you know, one of my real learnings about AI, and actually, I, I was working in AI 10 years ago, but I didn't know it was AI, it was just, just good computer science, is that just because you think you have access to one good machine learning technique, just be wary because it probably will not give you the best results or, or more, most re reliable results. And that's why Agrino has this real un unbelievable toolbox of machine learning, deep learning as well. I think that's really a lot of your intellectual property as well. So I, I hope everybody enjoyed the webinar. I, I most certainly did. I really want to thank Maria, Joe, Janice for, for really wonderful content and discussions. And I just want to thank you all for joining. Um, I, I think it's been another really fantastic part of learning for me and I hope you gain something for it as well. So it's goodbye from me and, and from our panel. Just, I think, a, a quick wave by to, to everybody who, who uh, joined us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Very much appreciate. And yeah, you are all invited if you want to participate, all the participants. You are invited if you want to experience firsthand the mycotoxin dashboard and provide some feedback because we are still developing uh, things in this you are very much invited to express your interest. So thank you. Thank you so much, all. Really appreciate your time. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.